Hello, everyone. Okay, I got to do that thing. Wait for us to go live. Horrifying 30 second delay. Waiting, 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 then leaping forward to kill the volume. Okay, I think which I just did. Ah. Wait, okay, shoot. I have, I have to un I have to unmute this for one second. I screwed it up. Hold on. Cause I can't hear any. Oh, Tony, you're here. Tony's always the first one in. Um, but I screwed up my sound. So output MacBook Pro speakers. Okay, there you go. Wouldn't it be fun? You know, it'd be fun if one time I started this in any kind of professional way. Wouldn't that be fun? But it wouldn't be me. I'm gonna unmute to make sure that I actually fix my speaker. Hold on, there's gonna be horrible feedback. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Wow. I just really, after like a year, suck at this, don't I? Just so unprofessional. Oh my goodness. Um, hello, Tony from snowy Montreal from New Zealand. Hello. Hello. Hello, Baltimore. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, it's a little chilly here, but my heater was really loud. So I think I'm going to leave it off. Also, just a kind of warning, FYI, I'm getting internet unstable warnings. So I have my phone ready to go with cellular hotspot turned on just in case I have to switch over. Um, but there you go. I'm, I'm very warm and cozy. I'm, I'm double sweatered. You know, you all know that's why I knit the third size of Socrates is so I can, I can double sweater and stay cozy. Um, Oh, Suzanne, thank you. No, I'm I, I'm I'm a, I'm a hot mess, but I I do thank you. Um, hello from Spain. Watching on my lunch break. Oh, shoot, I forgot to eat lunch. I'm gonna get really hungry by the end of this. Dang it. No, I have not. You know what I did find though. You think I'm not a hot mess? Let me tell you. I was unpacking my sweater bag because I I wanted to find another sweater. I found two corn chips in it. Not like a grown up person. Um, just thought I'd share that with you. Okay. Anyway, um, I am on the last couple of days before the book has to be turned in. And I'm, I've knit like two of the 50 swatches. So I'm going to be knitting like a mad woman and um, polishing up the manuscript like a mad woman. So, um, I haven't slept much. And I just wanted to say one thing before we bring on our guests that you're actually probably all here to see and not to hear me. Um, I normally let comments about my utter mess of an appearance kind of roll off my back. Uh, one of my favorite favorite ever comments from, uh, I think it was one of the Vogue Knitting New Yorks was, um, in, in student feedback, can't she run a comb through that hair and a little makeup wouldn't kill her, um, which I love. But I got an email saying that, that my, <laughs> on the YouTube, um, every time I say the in front of YouTube, I sound like I'm a hundred years old. Like on the Facebooks, like the interwebs, like on the YouTubes, um, but anyway, so the email said my lack of makeup or tending to my personal appearance on YouTube made it seem like I didn't care, like I didn't care about you guys. So um, I do just want to say that is not true. I care. I do care about you. What I don't care <laughs> about is um, my not, not that I don't care about my appearance. I'm, I was not I don't wear makeup. I'm not a makeup girl. Um, I did put on under eye concealer today for all of you because my eyes were really red. So I just wanted to say that because I, I wouldn't want anyone to feel like my lack of tending to my personal appearance is because I don't care about all of you. I do care about all of you. I don't care about being old. Um, a, a, a friend of mine many years ago when I was still young and my hair was already turning gray, told me that I should dye my hair because it ages me. 
I don't know. I, I am what I am. Anyway, enough about that. I just wanted to get that out of the way. I care about you. Don't care about makeup. There. Okay. But I'm really excited today um, because I have a very special guest and um, I have been a, a, a fan slash stalker for, for many years. Um, and I love, 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 love her Instagram account. Um, I stole some pictures off, off the Insta today. So I'm so excited to chat with her today and bring her <coughs> to all of you. So without further ado, please welcome the one, the only Gudrun Johnston. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I, I'm so embarrassed at how rocky my start is all the time. I've, every time I think I've nailed it, I forget to check one thing. Like I, I forgot to check my speaker output. So anyway, hello, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to have you here. We were talking um, knitting sheds before we all went live. So you're in your, your, your studio what, what my husband calls the tiny house. You're in your tiny house. Yeah, we just still keep calling it the shed because it is technically, like I said, it's a tough shed. So like, we just can't get away. We would call it fancy things like the studio. It's like, are you going to the shed? Um, <laughs> it's a very nice shed. <laughs> you know, but, 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 and does, and <laughs> but you have other sheds because that would be confusing upstate because we so, have the wood shed. Yeah, we don't and have, we have the tool shed. Right. We have a garage. So like all the tools and stuff like that are in there and ah. then the shed. Um, Fancy. No, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a garage. We just have a driveway, but you know. Yeah. And it's not, and I can't like call it the knitting shed either because, you know, I share it with my husband and actually he probably uses it more than I do um, for his, like he teaches, he, well, during the pandemic, he was doing a lot of teaching online. So he would come out here ah. um, and then when our son decides to come and live with us, um, he claims this space. And in fact, he's coming back in a week to uh, wow. be with us for a chunk of time. So this will be taken over by him again. So how exciting. <laughs> now, your husband's an author, too. Yes, he is. He has published eight, eight books, oh. yeah, eight novels. Um, oh, I didn't time. know that it was that many. Yeah. Oh, so he's like an actual author, not like, you know. Uh, make believe right author <laughs> holy moly um did, so can i ask you a personal question because my husband's a, a copy editor do you right. make him do you make him read stuff and like polish it up oh yes all the time absolutely 100 percent. i can't yeah like i absolutely he's he's a really good editor as well like you know he's good at just like cutting stuff out you know with his own work too so don't need that sentence, you know, you've kind of saying the same thing twice here. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> um, but yeah, thank goodness I have him. You're so <laughs> lucky. I know it's, it's really lucky. Cause I, I, first of all, eight books. Oh my God. I think writing is brutal. I don't know how, how your husband feels about it, but I, I think it's, it, it's brutal. I don't understand how people do that for a living. Um, yeah, I don't, Certainly some of his novels, which have been, you know, quite lengthy um, historical works and stuff like that. Um, I think he felt the same way at the start of them. Just like, how am I ever, ever going to do this? But, you know, he would have a routine and a discipline, just get getting words down on the page. Um, it's harder now because he is teaching as well. And like, that's where it gets trickier because he doesn't just have a whole day in front of him where he can just write. So he has to compartmentalize it a bit more um, and that is harder for him to do so yeah like the Stephen like Stephen King um he uh, he always I can't remember what hours you know I'm just picking random hours but it's morning he would yeah. always say I write from you know nine to whatever he exactly. absolute set hours which mm -hmm. was interesting because he said because someone said oh well what if you're really in a, in a flow he's like mm. yeah I if you're working in an office, do people say like, oh, what if you're really on a roll? Do you stay? No. Um, so he said he uh, starts every morning by reading what he wrote the previous day. Right. Cutting, ruining, throwing out most of it. But he because he just forces himself to put words on page every day. 
Exactly. And I do think that that is, that seems to be the significant thing. If you're just if trying to get through something um, and David would do the same thing, just be like, I'm going into the, the office or whatever room he was using at the time. I'm staying in there until I have written, you know, this many words, even if they're rubbish and I throw them out the next day, you know, like you say, but that does progress you um, towards finishing the novel, you know, but, but yeah, yeah that's too. <laughs> I stayed up here this week and my husband went back to, we, we're splitting our time now between Brooklyn and here, but I said, go back to Brooklyn. I need to, cause, cause he'll understandably get annoyed if he puts dinner on the table and I'm still on the computer. He'll like, be yeah. like, please eat before the dinner gets cold. I need to not worry about that in this last week. Yeah. You know, I need to just push through. But, um, but speaking of book, not, not that this is all about your husband, cause that seems <laughs> odd, but I did, you know, I just saw that your husband was right. So uh, look what we have. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited. I just stole a couple of pictures. Um, and I thought, I wondered if, it, and it, that's what's on the mannequin, isn't it? It is, although this is actually the original that I, um, yeah, so this is from, from the 1970s. Um, so this is the sweater that kind of instigated the, me putting the whole collection together because I was gifted this by this woman in Shetland, um, I think in 2014. So I had seen um, images of this before. My mum kept a lot of photos, uh, but I'd never seen this actual garment in person before. Um, and then, yeah, came across it. Another one that's sort of like a slightly different colorway that I have too, that are two originals. And um, this woman, Wendy Ingster, who has a business in Shetland, she gave them to me. Um, and that was kind of the point at which I was like, I have to do this collection about my mum's designs. Took me quite a while to get around to it, but that was sort of the seed that was planted, you know, firmly at that point was when I got hold of, of that sweater. So yeah, this sweater was completely, pretty much um, identically replicated. Um, and that is, yeah, the replicant sweater is on the, the front of the book. And so now, obviously, well, not obviously, I'm assuming you received the sweater only, no, nothing else. Oh, nothing else. No, there were no patterns written when my mom was running the business. Um, she sold the business to a woman who I think she had a couple of the designs written up um, into patterns because I was given one once. Um, but the majority of the designs, no, there were no instructions for hand knitters or anything like that. Um, so everything was reverse engineered. Yeah. So, I mean, it was local, local knitters that she employed in Shetland to make the pieces um, and anything that was plain um, stocking net, like these sleeves, these would have been done on a machine oh. and then, you know, and then sewing in. Um, my understanding is that anything that was lace or fair, those parts were hand knit. Um, but she had some, you know, like floor length dresses and skirts where there were large sections of stocking net with maybe just fair aisle on the bottom. Um, so yeah, a lot of, again, a lot of knitters in Shetland had machines at home um, that they could use for that, for those portions. And I, I love that. I love the mixing of, um, I mean, I'm a dilettante on the machine. I'm not very good. I have, a, I have an LK150 and I have a brother that I never really learned how to use, but the mixing of, I call it getting to the dessert. Like you have something really yeah. interesting at the bottom and then, you know, you have eight inches of stock in it and then you have a whole yoke, you know, get, get to dessert. I love that. And I, I love this shot. I stole this from your Instagram account. The, uh, this is a photo being recreated in your photo shoot. Is that what's happening yeah. here? Yes, exactly. Um, so my mom, like I said, kept this folder. She had a, you know, semi-professional photo shoot done at some point to, you know, promote her designs, um, she had brochures, you know, created that would get mailed out. Um, so I have all these black and white photos and um, we did the photo shoot here in Reno um, last summer. So um, I think it was, it was high nineties, you know, <laughs> hot, dry, I know. And these models were wearing like all this Shetland wool um, and they were amazing. Like, they did not complain at all. Um, and we were there all day, but um, I brought a couple of the photos along to the shoot. And so, yeah, just kind of for fun, we were getting her to, to recreate some poses there. Um, oh yeah. I, I, I bet the models love looking at uh, the original, the original shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. 
because no one has that kind of appreciation, like, you know, like a model. And, you know, when, when you say about, um, about uh, uh, 90 degrees, I, I, I was just looking at, um, I went to the Dior exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum, which is uh, unbelievable. And there's a whole photo section um, with some of the famous photo shoots and these amazing models. And I was saying to my husband, you know, no one can look at photos like this and read about how, oh, this, this model was, you know, Dior's muse and, oh, this model Chris, uh, uh, um, uh, Yves Saint Laurent loved and, and, and just think like, oh, well, they're just nothing but dress hangers and not bringing skill to the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that when I'm trying to be photographed and I'm like, <laughs> I know, I, it, you know, it's, yeah. it's terrible. I, I can't, I, I can't do it at all, but I love some of these shots. I love this one. I love the sleeve on that bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, I mean, is a theme throughout the book really are these balloon sleeves, um, you know, obviously a big nod to the seventies. Um, and yes, you know, a lot of um, my mom's designs included them and same with the turtleneck, that kind of thing. Um, but with some of the designs, I do give options, not for this one, because obviously the Fair Isle is such a part of that balloon sleeve. Um, but there are options with some of them for straight sleeves. You know, if people don't like, for instance, with this, um, the front cover sweater, you can just knit a straight sleeve, you can do a crew neck, you know, so there are options, which is also something that my mum provided, like in her mail order business, you got your brochure, you know, you checked your size, you would pick a palette, you know, um, although it was still to a certain extent kind of up to the, the knitter oh. um, who would actually be making the garment, they might kind of, you know, make the ultimate decision about shades that they were using or, you know, a color that they might put in there. But people also ask for specific things. So they might say, you know, they might ask for a particular um, palette or a slightly different, yes, neckline or something like that, um, which just customized wow. it even more. So, um, so I wanted to, you know, th for that to be kind of part of the book for the hand knitter too, that, you know, you could have options um, there, so. But now what's the, is that, la, that looks like a very small repeat. What is that, 12 stitches on the Farah? Um, for that pattern, it is, it's, yeah, it's not much. It might only be eight, actually. So See. that that sweater also had, there are two um, different Fair Isle patterns. Oh. Um, that one's like, that's a smaller stitch repeat. And then the, the orange version of that sweater that the other model is wearing, that's a larger motif. Um, but yeah, I mean, you again, you could swap in. Yeah, so she has on, um, yeah, a version with a with a different motif on the sleeve. I don't know why I'm looking down at my iPad when it's up on my screen. What's wrong <laughs> with me? Um, so, I mean, there's no reason it, it, with such a, a small repeat, that makes it extremely simple to customize. Yeah. So e e e you don't have to write, you know, do this for this, I'm, I'm hoping. I, I really hope that knitters are become empowered <laughs> um, you know, to take control of their own knitting, but that, that makes it a very simple, um, adjustment. Yeah. You know, who's obsessed with those sleeves. I was Nora gone is extremely into those sleeves, right? <laughs> she, she is like such a fan of the sleeves and she was really, ha she's really happy when she sees other people do them mm -hmm. because, you know, she told me at one point, like, I felt like I was the only one who liked those sleeves and now they're coming back. So she was, uh, you know, she's yeah. a fan only making a comeback when I see it in throughout you know fashion like you know other garments that I own that are not hand knit you know um I I have similar sleeves on yeah on those things too so they're definitely making a comeback yeah and the other thing is um uh oh uh Taylor said I just cast on for the uh let's see this is where this is where this this being really far away oh Vair V-A-I-R so that's this uh, yeah this sweater oh. Is there Ooh, almost halfway done with the lace? Oh, Taylor, how exciting! <laughs> Can't wait to see it. Um, love this one. Oh my god! So, like, some of the designs are you know, like I said, complete sort of replicas, like the cover sweater, and then other ones are sort of inspired by. Um, so my mum did have like a scoop neck tank, but like it didn't have this fair isle pattern on it. I don't, I've never seen it in person or anything. And in fact, there's an image that she had um, of one of the models 
wearing what I thought was an entire dress, but it turned out to be, um, which I realized when I kind of looked at the description on the brochure, because it would describe, you know, um, what each item was, instead of it being an entire dress, it was that sweater, the previous sweater you just had up with the balloon sleeves, you know, plain body, balloon sleeves, turtleneck, then a vest on top of it, and then a floor length skirt, basically. But from the pictures, the black and white pictures she had, it sort of almost looks like it's just one entire dress. And um, so that's kind of where those two pieces came out of it. It was like, so, you know, wanted to do a plain sweater with just oh. um, the color work on the sleeves and then a, and a scoop neck, yeah, kind of cropped um, vest. Um, and but again, I love that they, I right, now I do have to turn my heater on, I'm freezing. But I do yeah. like the dresses. Um, I love the dresses that are that are in there. I, I, don't, I don't know if I got, oh yeah. Yeah, and again, so there isn't an exact dress like this uh, of my mum. So this is where I had to make some decisions because I was kind of like, a lot of knitters are not going to do an entire dress because she did have entire dresses as well. Um, but, you know, a lot of stocking net in that, a lot of Shetland wool, you know, some people will make it for sure, but I wanted something that was maybe going to be a little bit more accessible for people. Um, so again, this is sort of taking some of the elements of things that my mom included and yeah, um, adapting a little bit for, for the hand knitter. I, this really would be, this piece in particular would be kind of my jam. And I would probably, I, I might just wear it as a tunic over pants instead of, you know, leggings with boots because I'm not young and cute anymore. But, yeah. but I do like, you know, I loves me a long sweater. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and uh, I, I find it very empowering almost that you're to know that it's a mix of machine knitting and hand knitting because um, <clears throat> I, I, I had this conversation with a bunch of knitters once at a retreat who felt embarrassed to admit it, like they were going to be accused of cheating or mm. betraying hand knitting somehow. Um, but there was so much hand knitting on their piece, but then there was like a big swath of stocking out where they just do, 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 same with the sleeve, you know? Yeah. So I, I, first of all, machine knitting is a skill, which took me, I'm not great at it, but I'm much better at it. Now I took a class at FIT. Like it's not, people think it's, I don't know what they think, loading yarn onto a machine and hitting a button and being like, tell me when it's a sweater. Yeah. <laughs> Get it then. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's yeah. a skill. So yeah, I don't know. I don't have it. Like I don't have any experience with machine knitting or, you know, so um, not, I did, you know, I, I couldn't provide that like as an option in the book because I know nothing about it, but yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of Shetland knitters. I don't know if you know, um, Ella Gordon, she's modeled other things of mine and she works at Jameson and Smith in Shetland does her own designing. So she does that a lot with, especially with yoke sweaters where, you know, all the fun is happening up here and then everything else is plain she'll do that on her knitting machine because um, she knows how to use it. I'm like, why wouldn't you? Like, I would totally do that if I knew how to use a knitting machine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the tricky thing for hand knitting patterns is uh, it's very, it can be, it's not impossible. It can be difficult to get your machine knitting row gauge yeah. to match a human hand knitting row gauge, but it's not impossible, but it does take work of swatching by hand, swatching in the machine, keep playing with the two dials until you get it to match because you can't, uh, uh, do you know, Amy Dachin? Yeah. She, she used to joke that she has like this bizarre, um, knitting technique that results in, in almost square stitches. So mm. she doesn't really design, but she said, if I ever once in a blue moon, if I design something, I always have someone else knit it right. <laughs> because she said, I can't publish a, a crazy like square gauge where my stitch and my row gauge are virtually the same right. um, because people would, you know, want to <laughs> kill me trying to match it. But of course my knitters know, don't match my gauge, you know, do your own gauge. Yes. <laughs> um, so you recently made a, a trip out of our land. Yes. To yours. Yes. <laughs> so what was it like going, I mean, how long has it, had it been? W was it longer than usual because of the two pandemic? Um, yeah, two years. 
uh, pretty much almost two years. Um, and I, you know, that was obviously a long time. Like I have never spent two years away from Scotland, you know, um, and, you know, Shetland obviously um, is a place that I visited a lot more in the last, like, I guess seven years or so um, because of Mary Jane and I running trips to Shetland. So, you know, it's now, it's become a place now that not only do I go there to visit, you know, my dad um, and now my older brother has moved back there. That happened during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we spend weeks there at a time, you know, like I go for five or six weeks usually um, in the summer and often I go again, you know, another time in the year. So, yeah, it was pretty bizarre to not have been back for two years. Um, you know, obviously just the travel part of it was not fun um, because of pandemic and having to wear a mask for like 30 hours or something because I flew it's from- that far? Well, it's, so I flew from here, from Reno. So I'm like, you know, almost West oh. Coast. Um, and yes. then I wanted to go straight up to Shetland. So I didn't want to spend any time on mainland Scotland before going up. So I needed to get, you know, I needed my flights to time, you know, so that I could get up there. So it's usually an overnight flight kind of from the US um, into Scotland. And mm -hmm. um, with, you know, I can't remember where I, oh, I think we changed planes in Salt Lake City um, and then flew to Amsterdam and then to Edinburgh. And then we had a really long layover in Edinburgh. Um, and that was actually the hardest part because um, we had most of the day to like wait for our flight up to Shetland because um, my son came with me and, um, you know, so it was very jet lagged by that point because I hadn't really slept on the flight, but we're still in the airport. So we still kind of have to, you know, wear our mask and stuff. Right. And there weren't that many places because things are kind of closed and well, they, they, they were then like it just the airport was different than it had been. Um, so I was really struggling at that point. Um, my son, had, like, he just propped himself up in a corner and like fell asleep. I'm just like, how could you do this? Like, I don't because understand. he's young. How old oh, is he? He's twenty. Yeah, I mean, he's an egg with legs. They can do anything at that age. He can also sleep through like three um, alarms. Um, we found out recently he was supposed to get on a train somewhere, and he just slept through all his alarms. And I'm just like. Okay. Um, so, it's, yeah. it's maddening. They can eat anything. They can, they can, you know, yeah. uh, be sick and bounce right back. Just, it's, it's maddening. I know. But so, you know, it did end up being something like 30 hours of travel and most of that with a mask on. And most, you know, my first time back on a plane, all of this stuff that I'm sure yeah, many people have lot. experienced recently. And um, yeah, and it's difficult. It's difficult, you know, stressful. But as soon as, you know, I stepped off the plane in Shetland, um, it just, it was all like worth it. And it was like this beautiful evening when we arrived. And I mean, it's always worth it, you know, arriving in Shetland. Like, yeah, I mean, that's my dad's house um, there. And that's like, that's where we ended up when everything else was just like, oh, okay, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, I um, love some of the pictures that you post of your family as well. <laughs> I mean, they're just, uh, they're, they're perfect. And look at that blanket and the little sweater. So who do we have here in this photo? So um, that's my grandfather. So um, sorry, my dad's side of the family that comes from Shetland. So um, my great grandparents, his parents are from Shetland. Um, and my grandparents had retired to Shetland um, in the 60s. And my parents decided to move there. Um, before they'd had any of their kids. So um, so they moved there, it must've been like, I don't know, 66-ish or something like that. My parents moved to Shetland. From um, where? Um, they had been living in Edinburgh before that. So my mum's English um, and my dad's Scottish, but um, so I think they spent a year or so maybe in Edinburgh and then they decided to move up there, partly because my dad's parents were living there and retired there. And then they ended up being there for 13 years and they had all of us, there's four, four kids um, in the family. Um, so we were all born there. And, and it was when basically right at this time when I was a baby, so that's me as a baby in a traditional Shetland hapshawl, and that's my um, sister Beth. 
um, who did some work in the book as well. So she did designed the end papers that are in the book. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite a, a family affair. And actually, my grandmother, um, she did some of the illustrations for my mum's kind of the first brochures that my mum had were all hand drawn figures. Wow. Um, and my grandmother did those. Um, do, so, do yeah. You, do you have them? Do you have the original drawings? Yeah, <gasps> yeah I do. I, I don't have any in here. I think that in the book, oh, there might be so some. Lucky. Yeah, so in oh, here, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make you bigger so we can see it. Uh I'm gonna make it bigger. Wait, wait, wait. Ah. Uh, ah, uh, I did it wrong. I'm terrible. Hold on. Why can't I make you bigger? <laughs> well, oh, I know why. Because I'd accidentally pin myself. I'm gonna unpin me. Okay. I'm gonna pin. Ah, there we go. Okay, now you're big. Uh, so these these ones here. Um, That's very cool. Uh, yeah, so so she was involved too. So it was it was at that stage when I was a baby, basically, that my mum was first kind of getting into her um, her knitwear business, and it started actually, you know, by clothing us and asking. She, we had a next door neighbour in one of the towns that my my parents lived in in Shetland who um, was a bit of a surrogate granny figure, but she was also an amazing knitter. And my mom just kind of started asking her to make things for, for my then like older siblings, um, older brother and sister, cause I wasn't um, born yet. Um, you know, and she started requesting specific shapes and styles and things um, kind of making them her own. And then um, friends of hers, you know, saw them and were like, Oh, you know, could you, could we get some of that, you know, made for our kids too. And, that was kind of like how her business started. It wasn't necessarily an intentional decision to just, you know, launch this business. Um, really? Yeah. And so it kind of developed out of that. And then she started doing, you know, adult garments um, after that. So, so that was all like my, you know, my first years um, in, of my life, you know, in Shetland. So I don't really remember obviously that time when she was running it and she had, you know, then she had me and then she had my younger brother. Um, they were renovating this old croft as well at the time. Oh, um, I love those. I love when you when you post them. Um, first of all, that's like my jam rehabbing. Right. I love when you write about that and you post pictures of that. That's my favorite part of your Instagram. I mean, well, the knitwear is nice, too. But yeah, and it's a well, it's such a, you know, a full circle story in that regard, too, because that image that you showed um, of my where my dad lives now in Shetland. So that's on the west side of Shetland um, in Sandness. Well, Sandness is a few couple, few miles down the road. Um, and so all the way in the background of that picture, you see another house. So that is the croft that he renovated in the 70s when I was a toddler. And that croft was called Little Booster and it was basically a ruin. And my dad, you know, spent Oops. a while um, renovating that and then we all lived there. And then when my parents retired back to Shetland, because they left Shetland when I was five, so I mostly grew up in mainland Scotland. Um, and then probably about 16 years ago, maybe longer, they retired back to Shetland and they bought Muckle Booster, that croft, which looks across to the old croft um, and renovated it as well. Like that was also in really bad, <laughs> shape and they put a little like extension on it and stuff like that um so yeah it's this it's a big sort of full circle and it was right at that time too that I started to get into knitwear design at the oh, time really? they yeah it pretty much coincided exactly at the same time um and so then when I got to go home I went to Shetland you know and spent time with them so alongside kind of me reconnecting just with the place I was able to kind of research and learn about the knitting traditions there. And, you know, so really kind of the two things happening at the same time um, was pretty fortuitous. And, you know, the, those knitting traditions influence, you know, my design work obviously, and have done kind of from the beginning. So yeah, it's- That is very cool. I, I also love that one. <laughs> I yeah. look at the knitwear in that one. 
So I recreated that um, little pinafore for the Shetland Wool Week annual this year. Um, it's called the Lizzie Pinafore. Um, and it's named after that uh, next door neighbor that I mentioned, um, who, you know, basically she was probably one of the first people that knit for my mum. And she probably knit that pinafore, to be honest. Um, oh, wow. But yes, I recreated that that little pinafore for the Shetland Wool Week annual. So that's available as a pattern in, in the annual at the moment. But also that that hat slash hood question mark? Balaclava type, oh. you know? Yeah. Oh, see? Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. Oh, yeah. so that so it's not attached. It's not attached no, to the sweater. Not attached. Not attached. So uh, it's just a, so adorable. Just I mean, it's a good hat for Shetland, just in terms of like wind and staying on and you know, yeah. like covering you up. Um, yeah. I love that one. And this is my favorite picture ever. This is when I, 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 uh, I think I messaged or maybe I've made a comment. I can't remember at some point, MJ message, um, Mary Jane Mucklestone messaged me because I think I made a comment on something. Uh, anyway, there was some photo. It might've been this one where I didn't realize it was your mom. Okay. And, and like, I, Cause it looked, there was another photo, you know, it wasn't this photo. Cause it was another photo that didn't look so clearly old photo. Mm-hmm. And I think I said, who is that? And MJ said, that's her mother, that's <laughs> her mom. So I just, God, she's absolutely breathtaking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, was, yeah. Yowzer. <laughs> like, like a movie star mm-hmm. in that photo. I just. I don't know why I'm obsessed with that. Well, what's funny, because um, when my parents first moved to um, Shetland, my mum was definitely sort of the much more cosmopolitan one of, you know, the couple. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, she had lived abroad. She spoke French and, you know, like she was very and she, you know, if you think about a sort of 60s style, like when she when they first arrived in Shetland, there's some great pictures of my mum, like in some pretty amazing outfits, you know, digging in the garden and stuff like that but you know with a sort of beehive hair and like little mini skirt stuff and um she oh, breathed- beehive I thought you meant like you know like the twiggy hair so she had the she had she had more of the beehive hair when they first got there um and you know she got more into the hippie you know the hippie look um I suppose not long after that but um my dad's so- rocking a very twiggy vibe yeah twiggy yeah it is yeah, yeah. <laughs> But my dad tells stories of her, you know, people just, you know, in Shetland being really kind of like impressed by her and sort of awed by her. And she briefly taught French at the high school there. And people oh. still tell me when I go back there who like were in her class, you know, just like, oh, when your mom came in, like everybody was like, whoa, who is this person? You know? I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, it's so you lovely. get that though, right? I mean, it's it. Definitely. I, I, <laughs> Like, I can't stop looking at this picture. I'm obsessed with this picture. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it, she's striking. <laughs> well, and it's, that's, so that's us outside the croft before it was renovated, um, Little Booster. So when it was still just a ruin. And did you live there during the renovation? Um, not at the early stages because like it was um, definitely a ruin. And um, I mean, it was a complete, you know, um shell basically um we weren't living very far away though and my dad would sometimes sometimes he would walk over um to work on it and sometimes he would take the boat which was a bit faster uh, like he would just take his own boat across because it was I mean Shetland's very sort of long and skinny with a lot of inlet oh. and stuff like that so um so yeah there was a period when he would you know take the boat um across and work on it and I guess at a certain stage we must have moved in um, I mean, I can't really imagine, you know, be living, <laughs> living in um, a state of renovation with four kids, you know. And yeah, how how old was everyone? Like uh, little? Well, I was a toddler, and and then my younger brother was a baby. Whoa! And my sister's like two years older than me, and my brother, my older brother, yeah, five years older than me, seven years older than me. So so little. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, wow. 
little, but, um, and to be fair, actually, my dad was doing a lot of the childcare slash renovations um, because my mum, my mum actually had a physical shop in Lerwick, the main town in Shetland, um, where she sold stuff as well. So she would, she would go in there. Um, I don't know how, how many times a week, whatever she shared it with a friend of hers. Um, and that's like, well, now it, you know, in in modern technology t- terms, it takes about forty minutes to drive from oh. from that spot to Lerwick. So um, back then, I'm sure it took longer. Um, but not that the roads are like big highways now or anything like that. But um, yeah, so so my dad was definitely doing a lot of childcare and um, finishing off things in the house. And yeah, wow. I mean, I guess it's kind of a toss up because which is harder because on the one hand if you're, there's like a, an age where you're so young enough to not know to complain or not know that this isn't, you know, regular or not, and you just kind of go with it. And then there's that age, like seven or eight, where you're just constantly whining and moaning and I'm cold and I'm, you know, at least that's how it is in America. Um, so I don't know, could, could be, a, could be a toss off, but yeah, <laughs> renovations in general, uh, are not fun in the best of times, let alone <laughs> actually doing it yourself and having it start with a ruin. Yeah. It's a little more complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, uh, Donna says, who else has a, a trip to Shetland on their bucket list? Me. <laughs> and actually, your t- ever since uh, Lauren Elkin did your trip, that's not just going, but going with you and MJ and getting to do nothing but this. <laughs> That's on my bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> I said to MJ, you know, you, you, there is so much to learn. There are so many different knitting traditions from all over the world, so mm-hmm. much that, that you become uh, like the more, you know, the more you become aware of how little, you know, if that makes sense. So yeah. every little bit you learn opens up, uh, uh, like opens up a door to a whole other room. And you're like, Oh, I didn't, yeah. didn't know what's in that room. So I, I feel like, um, uh, I, what I'd like to do is either spend my retirement or what I had said to my husband before the pandemic, huh? And then that, who are mucky mention is what I wanted to do was sort of incorporate travel and for pleasure with learning more about different knitting cultures so mm-hmm. that he could like come on with me. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, but yeah, there's just so, so, so much to learn. There is. And you know, like I learn something new every time when I go back to Shetland too, mm-hmm. you know, like that's just a one place, but it's like, yeah, some you speak to some other person, you you know, hear some other anecdote or whatever um, about the traditions and you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, didn't know that. So yeah, that, that's ongoing for me, for sure. Now, outside of, um, uh, oh, Donna was saying, I was looking at my Shetland, Shetland Wool Week annual at that very pinafore. Um, other than obvious, your obvious love uh, for your own land, is there, other knitting traditions or cultures that you sort of thought like, oh, I'd love that's on my bucket list. I'd love to go there and learn that because there's just so much. I don't, I wouldn't even yeah. know where to start, but. I mean, I think from the, the one that comes to mind for me is um, like South American countries because um, I traveled a little bit in Peru um, and Ecuador, like when I was very young, like did this round the world trip when I was 21, saved up and spent time there, but I wasn't a knitter then. Like, so, I mean, I could appreciate the knitwear and textiles and things like that, but it would be such a different experience to go back now. Um, and yeah, and just see some of those, the crazy way that they, they put the yarn around on all the different colors and they knit from the inside. And yeah, like that would blow my mind. I don't know that I could learn it, but. <laughs> oh, you could. It's, I, I, I believe that you could. I mean, I, I uh, um, uh, when I used to work in a yarn store, I would have to learn different ways to knit because a 
someone would come in and they, they, I needed to help them. They didn't recognize, you know, oh, you're a thrower. I, I'm a continental knitter. I don't recognize them. Like, oh, okay, I'll learn continental knitting. And I thought, oh, there, I've learned all the ways to knit. Yeah. Right. And then someone would come in and their stitches were sitting, <laughs> I said, backwards on their needle. <gasps> Right. Yeah. You know, so then I learned, oh, okay, Eastern knitting. I learned that. And then someone came in and, but your knits are sitting this way. So then I learned uh, Portuguese. And I mean, I, I learned uh, combination knitting. Mm -hmm. And then I had a student in sweater school and he had his yarn going around his neck. And I said, now, now what the heck is that? You know, and yeah. uh, what's so funny is he, he had learned from, uh, uh, Andrea Wong, and he called it Portuguese knitting. Mm -hmm. And later in the shop, I had my yarn going around my neck and I was working with a student and uh, someone came in and she was watching me knit. And she said, what is that? And I said, oh, it's uh, it's Portuguese knitting. I have my, and I was knitting. I was making the knit stitch at the time. And she said, no, I mean, what stitch are you doing? I said, oh, it's, it's, it's the knit stitch. And she said, oh, I, I, uh, we, uh, I'm from Bosnia. I don't know. I've never heard it called Portuguese knitting that I knit with my yarn around my neck, but we knit everything inside out. Mm. So, cause it, the pearl is easier. We just pearl, pearl, pearl. Right. Um, and she said, why do you call it Portuguese knitting? And I said, oh, I, I what do you call it? <laughs> she said, knitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's when I, you know, I realized, oh, Andean knitting, Bosnian knitting, Portuguese knitting, you know, right. all those, we, we like to name things by the country, but you know, it's, it, it's like when I went to Canada and I was in a grocery store and I couldn't find this white Canadian cheddar that we like. And I was looking everywhere. And my husband said here, they call it cheddar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Peru is really high up on, on, on my list. I love listening to um, Abby writing about all of her, her life there. Um, Japan too, I'd like to dig yeah. into Yeah, some of the amazing ways Japanese knitters and crocheters brains work. Mm -hmm. Very, very three-dimensional, very, very different than the way. Also their aesthetic for, particularly the fair isle aspect because, uh, um, Jameson's, um, which are one of the other yarn companies in Shetland. So there's Jameson and Smith and there's Jameson's and Jameson's have a mill on Shetland. So they, and actually, it's actually on the West coast, just near uh, the West side of Shetland where my dad lives. Um, so they produce finished knitwear too. They have these very high end knitting machines there, but one of their biggest customers is Japan. And, um, I remember um, kind of early on going in there like with the groups and um, Gary Jameson would be giving a tour and stuff like that and he would mention this but also kind of go you know we just do what they tell us to you know like because it wouldn't necessarily be their aesthetic to pick the colors or the pattern put them together you know in the way that they do um, but that's really appealing to me like when you look at um, Japanese mm -hmm. knitwear collections especially if there is a Fair Isle kind of theme to it it's, um, it seems, it just seems very Japanese, you know, like it's, you know, and it's, I like that aesthetic, you know, um, so that's, that's something I would definitely like to, yeah, learn more about, or just. Have you ever gone to the, the big bookstore um, in New York, the Japanese bookstore in New York? Yeah, such a good knitting section. Oh my God. Yes, yes. And I have, I've picked up a couple, yeah, of, of the Japanese um, knitwear books from there before. Yeah. And they're really inspiring. Um, yeah, I, 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 I really, really regret um, when cheapness rears its ugly head because I, I was in Japan once, I went to Japan once and I didn't think to bring an empty bag and I didn't think about the fact that um, the giant expense of the books here in the States has to do with the import tax. So right. buying the books in Japan, they're significantly less expensive. Um, right. And I bought like three, but I really, that was so, I should have come home with a suitcase full of books. I mean, what in the name of all that is holy was I thinking? 
but um, you know. This means you have to go again, right? I know. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, 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 I think I'm going on vacation in the end of December if our, you know, if everything doesn't end, but um, the world doesn't end, but yeah, I, I miss traveling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, me too. Just meeting other people. And I mean, it was nice to even, I did teacher, I do the teacher training for Vogue and um, there were a couple lovely teachers there yesterday or two days ago from Italy. And um, it's just, it's, it's so exciting now for knitters to be able, because of these virtual retreats, to be able to actually take classes from knitters from all over the world is, is, yeah. is pretty cool. Um, yeah. And I met these, met, I don't know, you know, you're spending an hour on Zoom, but um, just these lovely teachers and they all have such different perspective. It's, it's extremely cool. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so when you go back, do, do people, do you have that, that, um, do you know a, an author named David Rakoff? He's a, he, he was a, he's no longer with us, but he's a great Canadian essayist. And he wrote, um, he wrote an essay called the Canadians among us. And he wrote about how in America, he's this exotic creature because he's, you know, Jewish and gay. So in New York, you can't throw a stone, he said, without hitting, you know, someone who's Jewish or gay, that's nothing, but you're Canadian. <laughs> Ooh. You know, so, so that was very um, exotic, but so he was never, he said he was never quite American enough to be an American, but then when he'd go home, they'd say, oh no, you're not Canadian. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> now nah, you're, you're like an American now. Yeah. So he was kind of, he felt he was sort of stuck between two worlds. <laughs> like, does anyone tell you like, oh, you don't have an accent anymore. You speak with an American accent, which always cracks me up. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I, you know, it can be particular words as well that I've now started using and that goes kind of both ways. Um, and, but I do, you know, I notice that like when I've been home um, or just as soon as I'm back there, you know, my accent returns. And so, yes, maybe my family will hear that it's a little bit Americanized now. Um, but I'm aware that like it, it has changed sort of more back to what it was. I mean, I, I never really had a strong um, local accent. You know, I didn't, I left Shetland when I was five. So I don't have a, you know, a Sh- the Shetland dialect and the Shetland accent is very different from obviously parts of mainland Scotland. And then, you know, we moved around different parts of Scotland. So we lived on the West coast of Scotland on an island, a different island for a while when I was still a kid. Um, and we lived in Edinburgh. Um, and people, so if I'd lived in Glasgow, I might have a much stronger accent because mm-hmm. Glaswegians have, you know, a much stronger, typical sounding, I suppose, maybe to American Scottish accent. You think of train spotting and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's funny because I don't, I don't, I feel like, oh, I'm not from there, you know, when I go back, like even though I have now lived here for such a long time, we've spent time as a family living in Scotland as well. Like we've gone back at different points. Um, So my kids, you know, have lived there. They have dual citizenship. Um, Our, our daughter was born there actually. Um, Yeah. So she was born in um, central Scotland because we were living near my parents at the time um, that we had her and, um, and yeah, and we've, we've, in fact, my kids, um, I took my kids to Shetland, um, must have been like 2007 ish something like that I can't remember exactly but I took them basically kind of for a, a semester like they went to school um down the road from my dad I didn't ever go to that school but my older brother and sister went to this school and at the time there were only five kids there so with my two kids it was seven um so they went to school there you know for a term and um yeah and then we spent another year living in Edinburgh, another year living another, you know. So we've gone back and forth a fair amount over that time. Um, and that was important to me. I mean, partly sometimes it was just we were trying to live back there and, you know, decided like, now we're going to go back and we're going to live there forever. And like, no, we're not. We're going to move back to America again. And oh, no, we're not going to move across the country. And, you know, we've moved, we've moved a ridiculous number of times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, 
it's not over yet. <laughs> um, but I think for me, like I was saying, with that um, reconnection to Shetland, with my parents retiring back there, and me not, you know, I had been up to Shetland maybe once or twice after we left. But, you know, my identity was much more with mainland Scotland and Edinburgh. And like I spent a long time, all my, you know, high school and college years in Edinburgh. That's where I met my husband. Um, and so I, over these past, yeah, 16 years or so, um, I reconnected with Shetland and it's very much come to feel like a home for me. Like, I feel like I come from there. Um, and, you know, that wouldn't have happened if my parents hadn't retired back there, made oh, that decision, right. and, you know, and I have this, obviously this connection through the knitwear as well. Um, but yeah, that, so that's, that's been a different kind of experience for me in terms of returning, you know, back to Scotland um, is getting, getting to know Shetland again. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I just, I feel so comfortable there and I can, I could totally imagine living there, retiring there as well at some point. And, and thankfully my husband can too. So that's good. Oh, that, that is a, that is a very good thing. Cause there's, there's a few things in relationships that are, you know, <clears throat> there's n- not great compromises, <laughs> you know, what, like, one person wanting to have children, the other one not. One person wanting to live in California while the other one wants to live in New York. You know, there's there's a couple of things that are kind of hard to compromise on. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah, you, you were saying about different accents. That always absolutely kills me how for such a relatively s- small geographical place, did you ever see that old BBC show on um, The Singing Detective? It's absolutely brilliant. I knew of it. Yeah. There's a scene where the kid goes to London and, and, and everyone's saying, what is he saying? I can't, I can't understand. Can't, they can't understand a word, a word. They think he's not speaking English. <laughs> they can't understand a word that comes out of his mouth. Yeah. Which is hilarious. But yeah, the number of, I mean, I, I gotta say when I was in Wales, I did have that American moment where I thought I asked for directions and I was given directions and I thought, I don't think that was English. (laughs) I think it, I think it was, I just couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't understand a word. (laughs) Sometimes thank God for uh, subtitles now. Like when we watch dairy girls, which I'm obsessed with, I, I have to turn on the subtitles sometimes because both this, we're pretty good at the speed with which they speak being New Yorkers. But sometimes I'm like, I don't, what, what, what's that? Yeah. And then sometimes I have to Google, like there was a whole episode in Dairy Girls where they were talking about punt that, no, that's the, that's the punt purse. That's the, I'm totally puntless. And I didn't under, I didn't know what that was. So I had to Google it. They were going from, they were going from, uh, you know, they were going across the border. They were going from Northern Ireland to mainland. So two, two different kinds of currency. And punt is the slang for the, I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. So she, I mean, and that still happens to me, like in ter- what I was saying about like certain words, like there's still certain words that I use that are very British, like the boot of the car, like not the trunk of the car, things like that, that like switches that I haven't been able to make. But sometimes I'll find myself in a situation where someone's just like, they, like, they have no idea what I'm saying, you know? And I'm like, what, what <laughs> did you, do you watch Ted Lasso? No, no. Oh my God. There's a whole boot scene okay. where, she, where they're talking about boot. And he's like, but what about getting fired? Also the boot. What about, and there was a third one. And he was, so then they strung a whole sentence together using boot three different ways. It was, it was, it was good. I mean, it's fine if my husband's there and he can be like, oh, she means this, you know? <laughs> like, you know? And then I go, oh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, people still, you know, uh, in America, people think it's bizarre when I say, and any New Yorker says uh, on instead of in, waiting on line. We, we say waiting on line, not waiting in line. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, 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 uh, and Long Islanders get extremely annoyed when someone talks about being in Long Island. They're like, you can't be in an island. You're on, you're on, and I, you're not 
on. It's a, I don't know why that is like a freaking deal breaker with them. I, I have that about like driving directions, like where you are um, geographically, if you're drive, like you're going to drive down somewhere or up somewhere. And my kids like don't seem to have any sense of this. And so especially my daughter will always be saying like she lives in Massachusetts and she'll be like, oh, you know, we're going to drive up to New Jersey. And I'm like, it's down, like, <laughs> it's down from where you are. My husband does that all the time. You're not going up there is, you know. <laughs> But I guess because I have a terrible sense of direction, that doesn't bother me, but it really bugs my husband. He's like, no, that's, and so then I started saying over, just over. Yeah. That's... I'm going to go over too. Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to deal with it. Oh yeah. my God. It's three o'clock. We've been talking for an hour and I'm supposed to write a book. <laughs> Actually, what I need, what I need to be doing is knitting these 8 million little swatches to yeah. photograph and then write notes. Oh, anyway, it's very boring. Um, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for, I hope you weren't too cold in your, in your, I'm not going to call it a she shed. No, it's all, it's all cozied up now. In so. your knit shed. No, knit we're not going to call it a knit shed either. <laughs> I can't believe you share it. I'm not, if I do build my tiny house, it is being shared by, with nobody. <laughs> Fair nobody, enough. nobody at all. <laughs> it's going to be mine because right now I'm, I can't. You, you can't see the mess that is, I'm just tripping over things all the time. Like this is the only, wait, should I? No, I can't, no, I'm, I'm not gonna show. I, I was gonna, I have this camera plugged in. I could have shown you, but right. we're, we're gonna pretend that this is what the room looks like, all nice and neat, but yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's chaos everywhere around me, particularly now, so anyway. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, we have a, a, a little sign off that has grown over the years, but um, over the years, I, at first I, I would say, wash your hands, don't touch your face, knit on. Then it became wash your hands, don't touch your face, wear your mask, knit on. <laughs> then we stopped with the don't touch your face because we found out it didn't mean anything. It was just, you know, <laughs> wash your hands, wear your mask, get vaccinated, knit on. Um, and then I dropped it a couple of weeks ago because uh, last month, because I'm like, OK, we're done with that. But you know what? We're not done with it. So I'm going to say to one and all. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. Get boosted. And knit on. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to add all of your info in the notes below the video. Um, so whatever, uh, you know, your Instagram, your, or do you, would you rather just your website? Is that the portal to everything? Um, not right now because it's okay. like construction. So, oh. okay. Well then I'll do your Insta and your, which, and anyone that doesn't follow this one on Instagram, you're missing a lot. Cause it's like one of my favorite, um, <laughs> it's like everything it's, you know, knitting porn, travel, porn. it's all the, it's all the, it's everything. It's everything you want. Um, and, and for you, just know that uh, it takes the comments a while to transcribe and load onto YouTube. Mm. So in a couple hours, if you go, you'll see all the lovely people um, like Emily saying that it's on, your, on, on her bucket list, um, greeting you. Oh, and, and Donna saying hugs from Maine. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> I will see you all in a month.